Okay, hi there. Welcome to a macroeconomics video. Uh, in lessons yesterday, we were looking at this question. Does the UK economy benefit from low interest rates? So we're kind of revising aspects of monetary policy and thinking a little bit about uh, a decade or more now of very low interest rates in the UK and, of course, many other countries. And thinking about ways to evaluate the extent to which this strategy of low interest rates set by central banks has been of benefit to the UK. Keep in mind, of course, that it's the Bank of England that sets the base rate of interest. The Monetary Policy Committee meets regularly to assess macroeconomic conditions, inflationary risks and pressures, and they set the base rate. However, the financial markets, the money markets, the, the markets for loans, overdrafts, credit cards, mortgages, and much else besides, it's the financial markets that set the other key lending and savings rates. Uh, the Bank of England's base rate, of course, is designed to send a signal to financial markets about the direction of monetary policy. Well, this chart reveals, uh, this is the base rate of interest set by the Independent Bank of England, that base rates have remained remarkably low since the spring of 2009. Just ahead of the global financial crisis that engulfed the world in 2007, interest rates were relatively normal at about 4 or 5%. But within weeks and months, they had been cut dramatically from 5.5% to half of 1% in 2009. And of course, the Bank of England uh, also brought in quantitative easing or QE at the same time. So interest rates set as part of monetary policy have remained remarkably low, below 1% for the best part of 12 years now. And uh, this, I've added to this chart the average mortgage interest rate, uh, the, the average rate on a home loan. And again, you can see there's a, a deep cut at the time of the global financial crisis, and it's been a, a, a steady but persistent downward trend in mortgage rates over the same period. If you look at a snapshot of key interest rates in March of 2021, the base rate is 0.1%. Uh, the standard variable mortgage rate is a little shade over 4%, but you can also fix your mortgage rate at 2.7% for five years. Uh, but that said, uh, easy access savings rates, the rate of return paid to savers on their deposits, is less than 1%. And even if you, even if you uh, sort of lock in your savings with a, a fixed rate savings bond, that's where you sacrifice some liquidity and perhaps save for, for two, three, five years you are only going to get 1.35% on average. Shop around for the best deals, but pretty low returns on savings. However, the annual percentage rate, the APR on a credit card, uh, according to the data that I could find, was just over 20%. So the rate of interest effectively on a credit card is over 40 times, well, more than 40 times, <laughs> but well, a multiple of the base rate of interest. So keep that in mind. The base rate of interest set by the Bank of England, our central bank, has been below 1% since 2009. A, a remarkable period of very low interest rates. So we were thinking in class about you know, what some of the advantages and disadvantages and trying to evaluate the extent to which this strategy of low interest rates has been beneficial to the UK. And we start off by, by considering what are some of the potential advantages of low interest rates. On the one hand, of course, when, when the return on savings is low, the, the incentive to save is, is weak. That increases the propensity to consume out of disposable income. And if people are consuming more, uh, that other things being the same, of course, consumption is a key part of aggregate demand. Higher consumption leads to increased aggregate demand, which can stimulate short-term growth. Uh, second point is that if as mortgage interest rates come down, which they have, uh, that increases the effective disposable income of homeowners. You see the effective disposable income is income after tax, after direct taxes, but also after the, you know, the mortgage payment, the, the monthly mortgage payment has been made. So low interest rates, cheaper mortgages effectively gives people more money to spend on goods and services each month because their mortgage becomes a little easier uh, to service. And in theory, and can I emphasize that, in theory, it might make it more affordable for first-time buyers to get into the market if 
they can find a cheap mortgage. But as we'll come to that in a second, that's not always the case. A period of low interest rates uh, can reduce the cost of external finance for businesses needing to borrow to fund their investment. So cheap interest rates, in theory, again, should lift the level of planned capital investment. Factories retooling, businesses investing in new computer software and things. And if businesses are investing more uh, over time with a lag, this can then help to increase long run aggregate supply, the country's productive capacity, which of course can stimulate long term growth. On the exchange rate side, always important to think about the impact of, of interest rates on currencies. So a period of relatively low interest rates can help to keep a country's exchange rate low, partly because of the outflow of hot money, which then improves the price competitiveness of a country's exports. It also helps uh, a country's domestic uh, tourism sector, which if exports go up, that can contribute to a higher level of aggregate demand. Another argument, and I think this is quite a persuasive one in many ways, is that if a period of low interest rates helps to bring down the risk of price deflation, falling prices, especially uh, if an economy is uh, is suffering from a severe negative shock. And we've had two major shocks, of course, in the last 15 years. The global financial crisis from 2007 through to 2010 and beyond. And of course, more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic imparted a big negative shock on, on, on real GDP. So national output in the UK fell nearly 10% in 2020, the Bank of England, the Bank of England did cut interest rates to 0.1%, and in that sense, helped uh, reduce the risk of a, of a descent into deflation. And I think the government also benefits from periods of low interest rates. In this sense, we probably focus on the market for bonds, long-term government bonds. And if that's going down, the, the rate of interest on bonds is falling. The government can borrow more cheaply when financing their own investment spending, for example. So these were some of the points. It's not exclusive. I'm sure you'll be able to think of your own arguments. But there's, there's a pretty compelling case for saying that low interest rates has been beneficial to the UK, particularly in helping to prevent the worst impacts of, of negative global demand shocks. However, in evaluation, we know that there are also downsides. There are drawbacks. There are risks from having such a lengthy period of, of low interest rates. And surely, prime amongst them must be the fact, and it is a fact, that savers suffer from a loss of income, particularly if the real interest rate becomes negative. You see, if you're getting 0.5% on your savings and inflation is, let's say, 2%, then in real terms, the real return on your savings is minus 1.5%. And millions of people depend on interest from savings to help their fund their demand for goods and services. So millions of savers have really suffered in the last decade, myself included. Cheap mortgages, uh, well, a lower mortgage rate might make it easier to take out a home loan, but of course it depends on whether you can afford the loan in the first place. And cheap mortgages tend to drive property prices higher, which worsens affordability. People have to borrow more to uh, to get a mortgage and also if, if property becomes less affordable uh, more people have to rent and this demand for rented property goes up uh, renting becomes more expensive so you can make quite a plausible case for saying that low interest rates has helped to make renting less affordable more expensive and that's damaging particularly for families who can't afford to buy but have to rely on on rented property the other argument, another argument, is that banks don't necessarily pass on low interest rates to their borrowers, especially if they think that the default risk or the credit risk is high. Indeed, although the base rate of interest has stayed low, and although mortgage rates have come down, for many businesses, actually, they have to pay uh, on a loan the base rate plus a chunky rate of interest, let's say base rate plus I don't know, 8%. So for many businesses, borrowing money remains actually quite expensive in the, in the money markets. Uh, and, uh, and we know, for example, that credit card rates remain above, above 20%. The commercial banks may not necessarily benefit from low interest rates. Uh, they, could, they might find it harder to attract savings deposits. And if they're cutting the interest rates on loans, if they are, that might make the banks less profitable. 
And commercial banks pay pay tax on their profits. So if commercial banks aren't as profitable, the government will get less money from corporation tax. I think point five is really quite important if you take a short term, long term perspective. Yes, in the short term, low interest rates can stimulate demand and prevent deflation, but they can also lead and contribute, if you like, to excessive amounts of, of household debt. And that can be quite damaging when an economy uh, then suffers the next slowdown or recession. I'll show you a chart on that in a second. And linked with it, I guess, is the argument that maybe countries can become too dependent on cheap money, low interest rates. Uh, maybe there's a kind of, uh, we become almost uh, junkified for having to rely on low interest rates uh, to keep the economy moving. House prices have gone up since the start of 2015. The index of house prices shown here, nice index number chart, has gone up from 100 to 128.73. That's just up to the end of October 2020. So nearly a 30% increase in average house prices in the UK from January 2015 through to the autumn of 2020. And of course, that includes the, uh, the pandemic period. And the level of household debt, most of which is mortgages, uh, is now much higher than it was 20 years ago. In fact, the level of household debt is now a one, over £1.8 trillion, approaching two, £2 trillion in the UK. There's a lot of debt. If you express household debt to their income, uh, this should be household debt, not house debt. But if you look at all the debt owed by people relative to their income, it surged in the first seven, eight years of the last decade, all the way through to the global financial crisis, went up from 95% to over 150% of income. Now that's come down, but it still remains relatively high at about 130% of income. And I think the key thing from this chart is that if and when interest rates go up, as inevitably they will at some point, uh, that might make households quite exposed to uh, that change. They've got such a high level of debt that perhaps even a small rise in interest rates could have quite a big impact on their ability to service their debt. And indeed, I think uh, this could be my last chart, actually, that the average credit card debt per household, and don't forget you're paying an average interest rate of over 20% on this debt, the average credit card debt is now over £2,500 per household. And that's risen quite a bit uh, over over the last five or six years. And uh, this clearly raises fears and the extent to which when the era of cheap money comes to an end, uh, there could be some sizable problems for the UK. There we go. Hopefully you found this session useful. Uh, part of our whole series of revision sessions as we head into the assessments in the summer of 2021. A good chance, for example, to just to evaluate some of the costs and the benefits of this very unusual period of low interest rates. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, hope you join me again sometime soon.